Good morning, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and I'm in my car this morning here at this um, very, very old uh, cemetery, and there's like a real old section over there, and then there it looks like there's newer headstones over here and a, a little more land over there, but this is just one of the most peaceful uh, places. I should probably do a little thing and, and walk around uh, sometime in here and just show you some of the the very old headstones. Well, I mean, it, I've walked through up there before, and there's it looks like they're they're even prior to the American War for Independence against Great Britain, which is incredible. Like in the early 1700s, there are people that were buried in here, and there's there's little headstones that are just barely peeking up over the grass, and there's clearly some new ones. But the old section way up there is uh, pretty pretty remarkable. And there's a chapel building here, and there's a couple of just gigantic trees. I'm sitting in the shade of the trees. Um, it just makes it uh, so peaceful here. And just been reading, reading my Bible and um, and praying. Uh, a lot of a lot of burdens, a lot of things uh, on my mind lately that are um, very very hard. And um, God has has brought um, me and mine into into some difficult times in the last few years, and um, and even now. And I just think, <clears throat> okay, so. Now is the time to put my money where my mouth is and, and really, really actually believe that God has a purpose uh, for everything, even the things that are um, that are absolutely devastating to your heart. But you have to believe that or you go nuts. It's one, one or the other. And so I'm going to trust God um, and going to just keep focusing on Scripture and upon the truth and uh, reading the Word of God. <clears throat> so I want to do that. Second uh, Corinthians chapter five, verse sixteen to twenty-one. I read this with um, three of my kids this morning, oh, or excuse me, four, on the back porch. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. I think now that's not the whole verse, but that's one full sentence. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. So let me back up a little bit and start in verse twelve, so you can see what the there what the therefore is therefore. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That is such an important thing for a true believer, for a Christian to remember. Um, every moment of the day, from the time we, we wake up to the time we go to bed, we live for someone else. We live for the Lord Jesus Christ because he purchased us, he owns us, and we don't live for ourselves. We live for Christ. I want you to think about that. <clears throat> Pardon me. If someone does not know God, if someone really has not repented and they haven't um, come to the Lord Jesus and put their hope and their faith and their trust only in him for their salvation and they've not repented, really at the end of the day, the thing they live for, the thing that they live for in terms of the benefit for is themselves and the sin that they like and whatever it is that they, their, their agenda. But when a person comes to Christ, their agenda changes. What they once lived for is not what they live for now. You live for the purpose of the glory of Christ and the glory of his grace, <clears throat> regardless of what's happening. That is always the thing you live for, for the benefit of the name of Christ. That's what is to define our existence, which is itself another reason we need a savior because no nobody does that perfectly. In fact, we don't even get close to doing that perfectly. But that is the goal. The goal is no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at human beings anymore and think, oh, that person is just so amazing in terms of their talents or their abilities and the things they've accomplished, or they were in this movie or that movie or this show or that show where they um, have this great accomplishment or that great accomplishment. The fact is, really, none of that matters. If the person doesn't know God, if they don't know Christ, well, what good is any of that then in the ultimate sense? You see, you cannot compare eternity to a very, very short existence here on earth. There's no comparison between the two things. So you can have everything the world has to offer here. You can have absolutely everything. You can accomplish every dream, every goal, everything you've ever wanted. And it will leave you completely and totally destitute, empty, 
and in hell when life is over if you don't have Christ. And so really in the ultimate sense, the only thing that we have, the only thing we have is Christ. That's the one thing that never leaves or forsakes us is Christ, his gospel, his promises. So we don't look at human beings according to the flesh anymore. We don't look at people and um, think about them only or primarily even in terms of their earthly accomplishments, what they've done, who they are in terms of their fame or their, their own personal glory. We don't do that anymore. We don't look at people that way anymore. We look at them only as people who are either reconciled to God or they're not. And that's what causes the burden uh, in our hearts. That's what causes the, the godly and the believers, the children of God, to have great burdens in their hearts and to feel a constant need to, to pray for the salvation of, of loved ones, family, friends, and the world. You know, there's just, the, the need is so great. Um, and right now, at least in the West, it seems that the, the grace of God is, is very much diminishing uh, in our country. You know, young people are, are turning their back on, on God and more and more people are, are just being swept into the, the winds of change in our culture. They're, they're little children, as Ephesians 4 says, they're little children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And the thing is that the things that are popular today, all the Black Lives Matter and woke stuff, critical race theory, LGBTism, uh, it'll be different stuff in, in 20, 30 years. Uh, when my generation and the generation under me is dead and buried, it'll be new things. It'll be it'll be new ideas that people will be swept into and uh, embracing and, and everything else. So we don't look at people in the flesh anymore. We don't look at them uh, the way the world does. Once you have the eyes of Christ, once you have the mind of Christ and are hidden in him, now you learn to see people the way they really are. Did they know God or not? Are they reconciled to God or not? Are their sins forgiven? Or will their, will their sins be legally charged to them on the day of judgment? In the ultimate sense, that is all that matters. That is all that matters. We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is such an encouraging thing. If you have um, a past that just makes you cringe and shudder uh, in terms of how sinful you were, how evil you were, uh, the sins that you just soaked in all the time and indulged in all the time, you need to know if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, those sins don't define you anymore. Those sins don't define you anymore. There's a, an individual that keeps coming to my mind from the New Testament, from Jesus' entourage, Mary Magdalene. I think about her a lot. You think, okay... Can, can a person be more more destitute in the sight of God than to be a demon possessed prostitute? I think yeah, that's pretty. That's that's about as as desperate and hopeless as you could possibly be. I mean, you can't really can't really witness to someone who's demon possessed. I mean, you you can, and God could definitely use it. But um, a demon possessed prostitute, and she's one of the first ones to see Jesus after the resurrection. And it's an amazing thing to, to consider her past. But what, a, what an incredible Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, demon-possessed prostitute, covenant child that turned his or her back on God and, and ran away and, and ran off into every kind of immorality for a while, no matter who you are, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So God reconciled us to himself. God is the subject. Reconciliation is the action. We are the direct object. God reconciled us to himself because we were alienated from him and our fellowship and our communion with him was broken by sin. But in Christ, there has been a reconciliation so that now we have communion and fellowship with God. Think about the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the misery of that estate wherein two man fell? All mankind by their fall lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, uh, to death itself and to the pains of hell forever. But now we have fellowship with God. If we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son, 
now we have peace with God. We have reconciliation with God. And no matter how much we fall, no matter how much we struggle with sin, that is a peace that is perfect. It is a peace that cannot be shattered. Uh, it, it is not a temporary cessation, a temporary ceasefire. It's not a temporary cessation of hostilities. It is a perfect and lasting peace. That the Greek word Irene, that's where you get the name Irene. Irene is the Greek translation of the Hebrew term shalom, peace. It is true and lasting peace with God. He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, we now tell people, you need to be reconciled to God too. Please, please be reconciled to God. Okay, verse 19. That is, here's our ministry, here's our message. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Okay, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. What does that word mean, impute? That's a very important Greek word. This is the Greek word logizomai. Logizomai means to legally credit or charge. God reconciles us to himself by not charging legally all of our transgressions of the law to us. He doesn't charge those to us. If he has justified someone, those sins can never be charged. Any, any sin that I ever have committed, am committing, or will commit can never be charged against me, can never be imputed to me in a court. In the On the day of judgment before God, my sins will not be legally charged against me because they were already legally charged to Christ on the cross in my place. And therefore, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us and he remembers them no more. Now, verse 20 and 21, this is a very precious block of, of divine revelation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, we beseech you, we beg you, one translation says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then verse 21, one of the clearest statements of the gospel in the whole Bible, as far as a short, succinct statement of it. For he made him, meaning God the Father made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God in him. You see the substitutionary aspect? That is the heart and soul of the Christian faith and of the Christian gospel and of the good news. And people who think that Christianity is just a, a way of, of helping people improve ethically and making, making them a little bit better or whatever, you don't understand what the whole thing is about. The whole thing is Adam fell and plunged the whole human race, everyone he represented, namely every one of us, into sin. But if you're hidden in Christ, if you repent and believe in Jesus Christ, now he was made sin in your behalf. Christ at the cross has all of our sins legally charged to him so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. You think of Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17 is a precious Bible verse too. It says, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. That gift of righteousness, that imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, that is the very basis upon which we are reconciled to God and enter heaven itself, that is the heart of the gospel. The righteousness that I must have, don't have, and could never earn is a free gift achieved by Christ. And the only way you can receive it is by abandoning all trust in yourself, all your performances, all your good works, all your rituals, or whatever else you're trusting in, and believe that what Christ did, he did for you. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. The one who had never sinned, the one who knew no sin, the one who never lied, cheated, had lifted up his soul to an idol, who always had clean hands and a pure heart, that one was made sin in our behalf. So that in him, we would become the righteousness of God, meaning we would be moved from being under Adam's headship to under Christ's headship, and therefore we would become the righteousness of God. We would be, be the righteousness of Jesus Christ in the very sight of God. That's why when people ask me, do you think you're going to heaven? I say, yes, absolutely. Well, isn't that arrogant? Isn't that prideful? No, it's arrogant and prideful, and it's sinful to doubt that if you really do believe in Jesus. How dare we doubt that? Do, do we not think that it's sufficient what he did? 
To save us from our sins? Of course it is. More than sufficient. To give us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. We have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and reserved for us in heaven. What an amazing thing. God made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf. That's the beating heart of the gospel. That's what the Christian faith is all about. And that is what will sustain us when the bottom falls out and when our hearts are broken and when things don't make sense in life. We always have Christ and he will never, ever, ever leave or forsake you. So wherever you are right now and whatever you're doing, whatever, however things are going in your life, whatever difficulties you may be facing, remember that's always a call from God to pray harder. It's always a call from him to refocus your, your mind, refocus your heart on the one who died for you. That we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. It's such a liberating, encouraging, and freeing thing. I don't live for me anymore. I don't live for myself anymore. I just live for the Lord Jesus Christ, for him, the one who died for me and rose again. He took my pathetic, sinful life and gave it a real purpose, and that is to glorify his grace, to glorify his mercy. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have, all the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I hope that encourages your heart because it sure encourages mine. I can't wait to get to heaven. I cannot wait to see Jesus, and I can't wait to be free from the burdens and the heartache and the sleeplessness of this life in this world. Um, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Thank you for watching or for listening.